Thank you. Somebody asked me what emeritus means. That's the title you get right before you're called the late professor. <laughs> and I'm really honored to be here tonight to talk to you about Dick Heiser. I'm wondering how many of you ever met him? I know Bob and I, okay, so I guess I can't tell too many lies because there's people checking up on me here tonight, okay. Well, at the risk of being a little maybe melodramatic, I'd like you to think about your audio DNA. Where do you come from? Where do you come from? Next time you're outside the city on a clear night, look up, because that's where your DNA is. Not in the sense that we're all star stuff, but in the sense that most of what we know, most of what we now call science, especially the Newtonian variety, came from that question, that, that curiosity, that insatiable human need to understand. How come five of those points of light didn't behave like the others? And fortunately, those five points of light were not relegated to the dustbin of being statistical outliers. They were watched. They were studied. They were puzzled over. And it's the motion of the planets and understanding what that meant and how that worked and struggling with that over the centuries that resulted ultimately in a lot of the scientific discoveries that we know today. I think people have this innate desire to see patterns in chaos. And I think that was one of the attributes of Dick Heiser as well. One of my favorite books to struggle with reading. Do you have books that you struggle to read? <laughs> yeah, this is, this is mine. It's called On the Shoulders of Giants. It's by Stephen Hawking. And it's a collection of works by Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, Newton, Einstein. You know, some of these guys who contributed, right? But the point is to remind us that we stand on the shoulders of these great thinkers who challenged the norms of their times and, in many, and, and often challenged the common sense of their time and as a result made significant contributions to how we understand the universe. All right, this is a long introduction to say in our world of audio we too obviously stand on the shoulders of giants. People like Harry Olson, people like Harvey Fletcher, have names that are still recognized. But others of that generation, men like Wente and Kennelly and G.W. Pierce, who made huge contributions to the science of transducers, their names are already obscure. Don Davis, who certainly was one of the giants in my own personal life, wrote a chapter in the fourth and fifth editions of the handbook for audio engineers where he traces his own audio DNA. It's a fascinating read. He thinks back about the people who were influences on his life and in turn those who influenced the influencers. Well in my view Richard Heiser is also one of the giants upon whose shoulders we stand. He was certainly one of those searching for patterns in the chaos. I have three goals for the presentation this evening. First, for those of you who may not have ever heard of the name Dick Heiser or didn't know him, I want to try to introduce you to him. Tell you a little about, bit about who he was. Secondly, I want to sort of give you a tease, if you will, to sort of let you peer behind the curtain of the archives at Columbia College. And finally, and in my view, most importantly, I hope we can start a conversation about Heiser's work and his, the importance it is to our industry. So permit me to do a very brief biography. Heiser was born right here in Chicago in 1931. He attended University of Arizona, earned a BSEE, uh, went on to attend Caltech, 
earning an MSW, uh, MSWE in 1954. After that, he did two years of postgrad work at Caltech and joined uh, Jet Propulsion Labs in 1956. Not a bad first job to hold, is it? Well, as a uh, former college teacher, I was interested to find a few of Dick's college papers in the archives. Here's one. You can see that college students haven't changed too much. If you look on the upper right-hand corner there, it says uh, Richard Heiser, who's, um, well, I can't read it on my screen or on that screen. I need to do glasses. Who assumes no responsibility for algebraic mistakes. And you, you notice what grade the professor gave him, 28 out of 40. Another paper that we found gives testament to the kind of professors that he had at Caltech. Here's a uh, quiz. Notice the professor. <laughs> this is uh, Feynman. Of course, Feynman was a uh, Nobel laureate in physics for his work in quantum mechanics in 1965, I believe. So Dick was hanging out with some interesting people. From an introduction uh, to a paper that he wrote about his college time, he says, you know, when I was in college, I felt terribly cheated. I had been born too late. All the fundamental discoveries had been made. There wasn't, uh, boy, I should have brought my other glasses. <laughs> there wasn't much to do except pick over the bones left by the really great scientists. You know the feeling, looking over some fundamental idea and they're muttering to yourself, big deal, if I'd been there at the right time, I'd been the discoverer. Well, I've changed my mind. I now feel that now is one of the best, most exciting and vital times. There's going to be a lot going on that we could not have possibly imagined two decades ago. And he wrote this in the early 60s. So Heiser's day job was helping to design some of the earliest satellites that the U.S. launched. But fortunately for us, uh, his passion and his hobby was audio. From another introduction to a presentation, he says, a little history and a story which I often tell about myself. I've been an audio hobbyist since my high school days. I was awarded a number of patents on early trans transistor audio amplifier circuits. I was aware as others that what I heard did not always agree completely with what I measured using the techniques of the day. Armed with a reasonably good mathematical background, I assumed that I could overwhelm the situation with mathematics and understand what was going on, how wrong I was. Here's another thing I'd like to read to you. Unfortunately, um, hmm, I'm not quite sure how to do this because my eyes cannot focus on this. So can you hear me if I step out here? All right, then I'm gonna read it from here. This, his handwriting takes some getting used to. I'm gonna start right after you, where you see the line. I got into the loudspeaker performance business because I was designing amplifiers and wanting to measure the net acoustic output. A quarter million dollars for a good anechoic chamber, which I needed, did not seem feasible as an expense for a hobby. So I turned to electronics to circumvent this financial dilemma. I was able to solve the problem, and in so doing, found that I had a tiger by the tail because I was able to measure things which the acousticizers, his word, didn't seem to know about. We're going to come back to more of this in a moment. One of the cool things about the archives is that so much of it is written in his own hand. 
Heiser lived before the advent and the popularity of word processors. And so we have this remarkable trove of handwritten documents with things in the margins and things crossed out. And I'm going to show you some more of that in a moment. But it's clear that what drove Heiser was the fact that he could hear things that he couldn't measure. In 1966, Heiser submitted a paper to the AES for publication. And here he's referring to the thing that he invented, grabbing the tiger by the tail. That was called time delay spectrometry. So in 66, he submitted a paper to the AES called Acoustical Measurements by Time Delay Spectrometry. Heiser found out a few years later that his original manuscript had been tossed in the trash, only to be rescued by one of the anonymous reviewers there, who pulled it out, read it, and insisted that it be published in its entirety. That reviewer was Harry Olson. The patent for time delay spectrometry was issued in 69. But I, I want to go back to that paper that um, I showed you a few slides back. I'd like to show it to you in its entirety because there's some really fascinating things in this paper. I have yet to find this the typed version, and I'm not even sure that he sent this to the AES, but you know, all's fair now because we have the archives. So, sorry Dick if this is a little embarrassing, but we're going to read it anyway. Well, it's that time again. Another long paper by Heiser. I know it's long because I rewrote it four times. Each time with the express intention of hacking at that portion of my deathless prosy, interesting phrase, not necessary for an understanding of the object of the paper. And believe it or not, I did delete a substantial portion from the original version. Oops, sorry. I respectfully submit this paper of my April AES convention paper for publication in the AS Journal. This manuscript is an accurate duplication of the points I showed at the convention. However, in order to counter the automatic reaction to utilize the manuscript as interior decoration material for your wastebasket, <laughs> let me explain why all the words. And then there's something that I find so fascinating when you're reading through his stuff. Here's something he crossed out. Caltech is a pretty fair country school and has been able to produce its share of Nobel laureates. I don't think I'm going to say that. <laughs> and then he goes on to the part I read you just a moment ago. I got into the loudspeaker performance business, blah, 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 quarter million dollars, and so forth. I had a tiger by the tail because I was able to measure things the acousticizers didn't seem to know about. It just so happens that a loudspeaker, with all of its lousy, crossed out, deficient performance in a real room, is a microcosm of most of the horrible communication problems for which there are no mathematical solutions. It therefore followed that some basic communication problems were uncovered by this technique, reported on in the, as the two-part paper on time delay distortion. Part two, you remember, was originally an appendix C of the prior paper and went into that difficult part of the analysis. Some comments have been heard on these two-part papers, parens from PhDs yet, is that the subject matter was quite esoteric and difficult to understand. 
After pursuing this point with them, it was apparent that two things stood out. A, I was too soft in my approach at pointing out a glaring mistake made by Raleigh and carried right through to contemporary National Bureau standards. standards. B, most of those to whom I talked had memorized equations but had absolutely no grasp of their fundamental principles behind the equations. This present paper deals with a subject matter that is, if anything, more demanding of a grasp of fundamentals than the previous work, although it's a logical extension of that work. And we'll stop with that. Heiser was often frustrated that people didn't understand what he was trying to say. In the late 1960s, personal computers were still quite a ways off. The first instruments, instruments capable of performing time delay spectrometry was a collection of off-the-shelf devices worth about $30,000 in 1970 dollars. And this was the basic, this is Dick's hand-drawn rough idea of how you put this all together. It consisted of uh, HP spectrum analyzer, a Brulin Care FFT, a precision oscillator, and a hand-built so-called Heiser box, which made it all work. The guts of the Heiser box is a very ingenious and simple device and he makes a note here saying um, it doesn't require any batteries or external power supply so it's powered off the signal itself which is pretty ingenious. One of the early adopters of time delay spectrometry was a gentleman by the name of Cecil Cable. Cecil was a acoustician who lived in Canada who had read the original 1969 paper and decided to try to build a functional time delay spectrometer. At the time, Cecil was loosely affiliated with Don Davis from SANADCON, an organization that was dedicated to providing training in the fundamentals of sound reinforcement. With Dick's help, Cable assembled an analyzer, began making measurements of loudspeakers in real rooms. Well, Davis soon saw the value in disseminating this technology to a wider audience, and in 1978, Don Davis convened the first TDS workshop. There were 20 attendees. They were given training in the theory of TDS by Dick himself and were ultimately granted a license from Caltech to build and operate a time delay spectrometer. A good number of the original 20 did scrape together the 30 grand to assemble a working system. Well, the result was exactly what Don Davis wanted, a powerful analyzer in the hands of folks who were out in the industry doing things rather than in academe. In the early 1980s, Caltech signed an agreement with Crown to build a purpose-built TDS analyzer. The TEF-10, designed by Gerald Stanley, was introduced at a little over $12,000. And we have one of these, actually it's a TEF-12, but it's, looks, it's the same machine sitting out front for you to play around with if you want. In preparing for this presentation tonight, I met with Gerald Stanley, and he, he was telling me of the very first Crown TEF training seminar. Imagine this. Jerry Stanley and Don Eager carrying the first prototype TEF-10 out to California to show it to Dick Heiser. Gerald says that Dick was very impressed. And Heiser, who had never written a line of programming code in his life, began writing code for it the next day. <laughs> Heiser taught himself programming essentially overnight. <coughs> now, Dick also held patents f on the application of time delay spectrometry to underwater imaging. That's Dick on the left. <laughs> so this is a, a towed array that would be towed behind a ship for mapping the uh, 
surface of uh, underwater. And he also held a patent on the application of time delay spectrometry to medical ultrasonic imaging, including 3D imaging. Remember, this is back in the early 80s. Heiser was controversial. He made claims that were seen as outrageous. You noticed in a previous slide I put up, he was challenging Raleigh. That takes some guts. He was often critical of the Fourier transform, saying that he called it a degenerate form of a, of a different transform. Of course, he was using degenerate in the mathematics sense, which is not necessarily pe pejorative, but that's not the way it was understood. Um, he called it a degenerate form of a more general transform, which he called the TDS or the Heiser transform. This was seen as arrogant or presumptuous. And yet, as Bob alluded to, he was voted in as president of the AES before he died. And he died before he could take office. There's the second part of that pair of slides. To date, the AAS has only published one collection of the works of an individual, and this is it. Time Delay Spectrometry, an anthology of the works of Richard Heiser on measurement, analysis, and perception. I highly recommend this anthology to you if you wish to learn something more about Heiser and his work. It includes not only the work he published in the journal of the AES, but also a number of articles he wrote for Audio Magazine. And if you're just dipping your toe into the works of Heiser, I strongly recommend you start with the Audio Magazine articles. The others can get pretty heavy pretty quickly. Heiser said, the ability to measure the anechoic response is a minor, though important, application of TDS. Its real benefit begins to be felt when we can begin to map to a higher dimensional spaces of types yet imagined. That lies ahead. Now, the archives contain a number of presentations that Dick did over the years. Some at AES section meetings just like this. I'm fond of these presentations because they tend to dumb down a little bit some of the things he was saying and make them a little bit more accessible to plain folks like us, or at least plain folks like me. Some of them are in outline form, but a few of them he wrote out verbatim. I'm going to share with you a few pages from an undated verbatim presentation that was most likely presented to an AES or maybe an ASA chapter meeting in the early 80s. And I'm going to project his slides that go along with this. In the words of Dick Heiser. Let me start by stating my personal position. I do not even pretend to know how the brain hears and gives us the illusion of sonic presence. My goal is not to find out how we hear, but to learn to analyze what we hear. Principally, to develop a mathematics and from it, a set of objective measurements which will help us understand subjective perception. The definition of what I mean by the term subjective perception is as follows. Subjective perception, the awareness of our real or apparent physical environment through our senses. Make no mistake about it, we are dealing with a mental experience, an illusion of real or apparent sources of sound. The way in which this illusion is created does not have to obey a mathematical structure. But if the resultant illusion relates to a real or apparent physical world, then the structure of that illusion can be analyzed in terms of elements which obey the laws of physics. That is, 
Our sensory input somehow creates a mental perceptual image which we can relate to an apparent physical world. Please note, the apparent physical world does not have to be either perfect or absolutely related to an actual physical world, but it does have to be structured with all the necessary elements that an actual physical world might possess. This is in fact what we unconsciously do in the process of perception. And it is why I have chosen this unusual avenue of approach to analyze subjective audio. The intent is that some objective measure of the illusory world created through the sensory input components can lead to a measure of the subjective listening experience. Why am I doing this? Because, number one, I believe that the end product of audio engineering is the listening experience. And if we really want to do a good job, we must deliver the most acceptable listening experience for the buck. That bears repeating. I believe that the end product of audio engineering is the listening experience. And if we really want to do a good job, we must deliver the most acceptable listening experience for the buck. Two, we should stop talking about the lack of correlation between subjective and objective and do something intelligent about it. And reason number three, I will put as a warning. The days of the blind giant are coming up fast. We are soon going to be able to unleash vastly powerful number crunching methods in audio. And if we don't know how to direct this monster, it can destroy us. I believe we must establish a scientific base before the fact, or we might blow it. I think you're seeing a microcosm of that right now in quadraphonics, where the technical fact we could do something has raced ahead of the scientific basis for why and how to do it. Let's look at how we can begin analyzing subjective audio. We cannot hook meters into people. So how might we start an objective analysis of perception? The answer is, we can do this by seriously examining the descriptive terminology used to answer the question, what does it sound like? What do we find when we look at the words? The illusion is multiple dimensioned with different coordinates of measure. There might be a where and an extent that might be measured in angle and space measure, a when in relative time measure, a tonal property in pitch values, a how much in intensity units. But the point is that these are multi-dimensional. But what do we find when we look at the way we, how we, I'm sorry, but what do we find when we look at the way we now analyze audio systems? The math we use is one-dimensional. Frequency response, time response. In other words, we cannot use our present math to describe the way we hear things because the form of the math is wrong. Close quotes. He goes on for about 30 or 40 pages and develops a very heavy math with a lot of very heavy squiggles and his ideas on how to begin to get a grasp on this burning question that for him was all encompassing. How do we measure the subjective? How do we relate the physical or the objective to the subjective?
Well, in my view, Heiser died at a most inconvenient time. He died before he could realize the full potential of TDS. He died at the dawn of the digital age, and I think that's what he was referring to when he talked about the days of the blind giant. Many of the questions that Heiser was posing, his fascination with multidimensional mapping, his questioning the relationship between the measured and the perceived, have not only gone unanswered in the 28 years since his death, but have, to a great degree, disappeared from the conversation. We've become obsessed with digital, not only as a storage medium, but as a way to do processing that Dick could only have dreamed about. And yet, we still measure the same things that we measured when he passed away in 1987. When I asked Don Davis if Heiser's work is still relevant today, Don replied, the relevance of Dick's work is obvious to me in his statement, quote, it gives me a certain pain to give away in 10 minutes what took 10 years to put together. <laughs> Those of us who heard him say it came to realize that it took us 10 years to understand what Dick said in 10 minutes. Here's my last slide. I found this on the back of a presentation. Can you read that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's my fervent wish that some young investigator equipped with a double-edged sword of reason and curiosity will take up Dick's work and begin to move audio science out of the flatland that it currently inhabits. This is the reason the Heiser archives exist. Now, before I close, I'm gonna, I have a treat for you. And this was on, and then it was off, and then it was on, then it was off, then it was on, and I'm glad to say it's on. We have some videotape of Heiser talking to a very early TDS class uh, in 1984. No, in 19, must have been 74. Anyway, uh, if you'll roll the tape, we'll watch a few minutes of this, and then um, I'll entertain questions from anybody but Howard. <laughs> You think it's me, the R pickup? Yeah. Where's your receiver? Right here. Yeah. Go away and it's, it. Well, let me find out where the hot spots are. Well, let me let's find where the, the dead spots are. We can. So it's typical AES stuff, the inhabitant stuff, oh. by the way, Don Davis, Jim Heiser, and yeah. some great minds of audio trying to figure out how to use their wireless mics. Well, did I follow you up by wrapping this? Yeah, well, which? Oh, okay. Well, that ought to be okay. Yeah, it is. It is. I won't lie down on the floor unless somebody throws something at me. Okay. I want to point out this new tool is not an extension of your existing tools. It came from a different place, and it came from a different philosophy. And uh, as a matter of fact, it emerged from a new paradigm. Okay? I'm using the descriptive terminology of Thomas Kuhn, who suggested a paradigm is the way you think about something. It's your conceptual model. Kuhn suggested that approaches, new approaches to a subject came not so much as standing on the, on the shoulders of your forebears, increasing knowledge so much as sometimes a totally different way of looking. You get to a certain point with your conceptual model where enough things don't fit 
you can't make it work, somebody comes up with a different model. So this, I think, is what we're talking about here. Now, this new tool will challenge the way you think about things. And that's why I'm going through this rather abstract procedure. It'll challenge the way you think about time, frequency, energy. Some of the basic concepts like dimensionality. We think of this room as three-dimensional, for example. Now, if you do have a model of the way things work, now, we all have models. Uh, there are two competing models of light. Light is a, is a particle. Now, the model light is a wave. Each one can predict th certain things. And uh, people were shocked to find that the wavelengths and particle are somehow were, were complementary. Those are models. The way to check whether you're not your, your conceptual model is correct is to put nature to the test. Because one of the things you want to find out, can you predict ahead of time, based on your model, what the outcome will be of any particular controlled situation? Light hitting a mirror does what? Now, the first good clues that may be an ongoing paradigm may not be complete emerges when you can't explain why an experiment that you can repeat over and over again works. Another good clue is if your model, your theory, gets very convoluted. Because usually the simplest theories are the more fundamental. And of course, if your theory gives wrong answers, you're in deep trouble. Now, in Kuhn's work, he didn't give any uh, suggestions of how to check whether a paradigm would be a possible uh, new uh, successor to an ongoing paradigm. I'm suggesting two. That, first of all, the, the new paradigm, the new way of, of looking at things, must explain everything that the old way does. Nothing can be missing. Furthermore, in order to be a valid replacement, it has to explain things that the ongoing paradigm cannot, and predict things which the ongoing paradigm cannot, but which can readily be demonstrated. You're very practical people. I think we all are. I'd like to think I am. Why worry about a new paradigm? One of the reasons is, if, in fact, there is an emerging paradigm, you may find that you're out in the cold if you're at least not aware of it. You might lose out. Now, one of the ways of finding out whether your present way of looking at things may be incomplete is when you can't explain why something works. Here's a small tear in the fabric of contemporary understanding, and I tried to pick the simplest example I could from circuit theory. There's absolutely nothing in existing circuit theory to explain why this situation prevails. Take a simple battery, capacitor, and any network in that has the following property. It does not have steady state potential energy density storage. Inside here can be a short wire, short circuit. It could be a coil. It could be a tank circuit. It could be an electromagnetic antenna. 47 light bulbs. It can be a motor that drives a water pump that pumps water up into a reservoir while current is flowing. And as soon as the current dribbles down, the water coming down runs backward as a generator with 37% efficiency and puts current back in anything. And a simple capacitor. And the question is, what happens when you close the switch? Well, the new paradigm, which we'll be discussing, predicts that if you transfer a total amount of energy, E, out of the battery, you must end up with half of it observable. The other half will not be observable to you. This is what happens. The current in the capacitor is, of course, related to the rate of change of voltage across the capacitor. If you take the energy out of battery, the sum of V dot I, you find that CV squared. Network N is not in it. 
The energy stored on the capacitor is, of course, one half CV squared. <coughs> this is a legitimate, parado a legitimate paradox with contemporary theory. That's a small tear. Here's a huge tear in the fabric of contemporary understanding. Why should some mathematical procedures, mathematical operators, commute in the order of their application? That is, you do one thing, then the other, and you get the same result as if you had inverted the procedure. Why should some of them do that and others not do it? There is no way of predicting ahead of time whether two arbitrary procedures, like taking a derivative and multiplying, okay? You multiply two things and take the derivative, it's the same thing as taking the derivative of the product, of course. But suppose you multiply by x and then take the derivative with respect to x. That doesn't commute. Why? The paradigm also explains this. Now, this, the importance of that, anybody who is involved in quantum mechanics will realize that is the heart of one of the biggest problems in contemporary quantum mechanics. Okay. Now let's get down to the bottom. Enough. The thing we'll be discussing is going to sound mystic. It's not at all. I think you find it's very practical. The hypothesis, first of all, that there is and is. That's expressible in the fact of, of a what I just called a principle of alternatives. That nature proceeds without prejudice to whether or not you're looking. It doesn't care whether you look or not. And that if you have a variety of different ways of looking, there's no preferred way of looking at nature. Nature doesn't care how you choose to look at it. And the alternatives is the name that's, that's given to the different ways of looking at nature, equally valid but different ways, and equally valid under some condition C to be defined. And there are an infinite number of these different alternatives. So nature doesn't care how you look at her. If you want to look at one frame of reference, that's okay. It'll proceed without prejudice to your frame of reference. You look at another alternative frame of reference, and there are an infinite number of alternatives available. This is completely consistent with another hypothesis, which dates to a little over 60 years ago, that you enable the is. That is to say, Einstein's famous uh, dictum that it's a theory that establishes what you can observe. For those who have not been involved in philosophy of science, it sounds abstract nonsense. It's not. It's at the heart of one of the biggest problems in contemporary science. Now, if there's no preferred frame of reference, no, nature doesn't care how you choose to look at it. And if you have a valid way of looking at something, and I have a valid way of looking at something, the same thing, how can you change your way of looking into my way of looking? How can you see things as I would see them? What is the map, M, and under what condition C could you take your way of looking in F and make it into my way of looking in G? This is the abstract mathematical expression. What is the map M that can take an F into a G under condition C? This is possibly the simplest of all such maps. A thing, an observable. And there's some frame of reference x. x is a, in this case, a n as in Nancy dimensional system. x1, 2, 3, this axis, this axis, this axis, and so on. You have a functional representation in terms of x. The procedure that can take you into multiply by some to be determined mapping kernel, and you sum over the entire space of x. And of course, when you do that, you remove all x dependence and you're left with y. You could look upon this mapping kernel as expressing the new coordinate system in terms of your existing coordinate system as the key. And of course, if you can take your way of looking and convert it to my way of looking, if they're equally valid, I can take my way of looking and convert to your way of looking. So there should be some other way of going back from an F into a G. Not mystic. Now, if no view is preferred, that is, nature doesn't care whether you look at it in your frame of reference or I look at it in my frame of reference, if there's no preferred frame of reference and you're contemplating alternatives of the same thing, then what doesn't change 
as you go from your way of looking to my way of looking? Is there some property that's inherent that doesn't change simply when you change the way you look at it? Well, obviously, whatever that property is, it cannot depend upon way of looking. <clears throat> that is, the property cannot itself be a function of some coordinate. There's only one entity that has that property, the net how much. You could look at it in a crude sense and say the thing that distinguishes a Mona Lisa from another painting is the total amount of paint. That's the end of it. Suppose we say that there is a property and being independent of coordinate system, it must be a scalar by definition. And that that single scalar entity, that single scalar how much, without giving other justification, I'll simply call energy, total energy. Total energy is the name of that thing. In other words, total energy isn't changed simply when you change the way you look. And what does it mean to say your way of looking? You're looking at the total energy in terms of your frame of reference, so what you're seeing is energy density in terms of your frame of reference. I see an energy density in terms of my frame of reference. And both of us, the total net how much has got to be the same. In the philosophy of science, one of the biggest difficulties is to come up with the meaning of the term observe. What do you mean observe? Without giving any defense to it here, although it is defendable, I'll say that observe means transfer of energy density from one frame of reference to another under conditions of conservation of this net scalar constant. In other words, under the conditions that I can't change total energy just by looking at it in a different way, called conservation of energy, that observe means a transfer of energy density from a frame of reference to the frame of reference of the observer. And to observe means transfer under Lebesgue integral measure. This says, in effect, there's no way to observe nature without, in fact, becoming part of it yourself. You must interact ultimately. But it's transfer of Lebesgue measure. No, you won't find this in books. Okay, so far abstract. Now, let's get a little more general. There is a scalar entity. And by the way, this conservation is the conservation of energy. This is, in fact, a fundamental observation. If there is a scalar constant, call it E, which doesn't change depending whether you look at coordinates S sub i or S sub j, if you summed over all the coordinates in the S sub i look, or summed over all the coordinates in the S sub j look, you'd still have the same entity. And there are an infinite number of these ways of looking. If you say that that entity is finite, the energy is finite, this is now a simple expression of that. Two different ways of looking must have the same scalar factor. Now, if energy density in any frame of reference is what's called positive definite, in other words, there is no such thing as negative energy density, then this equation, which is hopelessly too simple, can now be put in this form, where if this is a, prop, is a number which is never going to be negative, it can always be expressed as the magnitude of some complex number. It has to be a complex number because it has to have the two uh, parts. There's, in other words, if I came up with a with three squared, you could come up with square root of three times minus square root of three. You'd end up with the same number. So I have to include the imaginary part as well. That says I can define a parameter h of s such that its magnitude squared is e of s. The moment I do that, I've now put this integral into a form that's known in mathematics as the big integral. And it turns out that there, if, F, if H is compor, uh, composed of a so-called real part and a so-called imaginary part, and let me point out, the concept of what we now call imaginary numbers, a number which when multiplied times itself gave a negative entity, was so absurd to some of the people in the 1600s and 1700s that even the, the, the free thinker Descartes Cogito ergo sum, who was willing to accept your point of view, considered it an absurdity. It was an image of the mind. These were imaginary numbers. And that name stuck. This is a number complex, composed of two types of number. Of that type of number and of that type of number. And the word imaginary was put on originally as derision. But it has stuck. 
and it still sticks in the craw of students who think that somehow an imaginary representation has no significance. Newton could not accept imaginary numbers because in his day he didn't see their need in his mathematics. Turns out they were there. They're not image, images of the mind. So there is a, an entity H of S composed of an F of S and an IG of S such that that magnitude squared has to equal this and this is a basic law based on the, the paradigm. A necessary and sufficient condition that there be such a complex H was proven in 1939 publication by British mathematician Tishmarsh that the necessary and sufficient condition were that these two parts be related by a particular integral transform called the Hilbert transform. When that transpires then, this is necessary and sufficient, the strongest of all. It says then the total energy density, that guy, is the magnitude squared of this entity and it must be composed therefore of two parts. So the result of this paradigm is that there's a conserved scatter entity and any observation must have two parts. So if you are a ten-dimensional being on Andromeda in your ten-dimensional coordinate system, in each of your coordinates, any observation along that coordinate must have two parts. Observation in transfer of measure. One part will be given by some F, and the other part by G, which will be related by Hilbert transform. And let's call these two parts by the names which had been conventional. We'll say that E of S is total energy. Up on that in front. This we'll call potential energy density, and this kinetic energy density. So what we have is that there is an energy functional, H, in terms of any frame of reference. See, I haven't tied it down to anything yet. I haven't said we're talking about distance or momentum or position or time or frequency. Anything. That any observation of nature in which there's an energetic process must consist of two parts. And these two parts are in quadrature, that is, they're complex in this particular way. They're related by Hilbert transform. And the energy of the observation will be proportional to the squares of the two parts separately. There will be a potential energy density term, which is one half times some something times F squared. Ever see one half MV squared, one half LI squared, one half CV squared, and on? Why that silly half? Why was it squared? And why was it that when you took a total energy, mc squared, there was no half. Well, possibly why. The other component will be a kinetic component, which again will be one half times something times something squared. Yes, this has to do with TDS. Yes, it has real practical application. And yes, it will challenge your thoughts of time and frequency. Now, this is an energy functional. It's energy density in terms of any frame of reference S you want. One of the problems is when you come up with a concept, you put a name on it like Jet Propulsion Laboratory. We haven't jet propelled anything in 30 years. That was a great name when it happened. Okay, So you don't want to put a name on it that sticks you forever in one regime. So it's an energy S function. You pick the coordinate. Energy time function energy frequency function, energy distance function, energy S function. It is an energy function. Now, that function takes on a particularly useful form if you take its logarithm. And the logarithm of this, the representational curve, to give it a name, I called it an energy curve. It's the energy S curve, the energy time curve the energy frequency curve. It is the logarithm of the functional, energy functional. And generally you have an amplitude part and a phase part of the energy functional, H of S, and the logarithm of that has a real and an imaginary part. Now the reason for describing this energy curve is that if you're dealing with physical processes, sound in a room, electrical networks, 
it has a very unique signature for very important properties of interest. Properties like resonance, properties like reverberation. This curve has characteristics, whereas the energy function itself is not necessarily has any characteristic curves. Okay, I've reached the yellow piece of paper, which means by this time you're probably glazy-eyed. And ask, there is no dumb question. There are only dumb answers. So I'm sure there are a lot of questions at this point. Let me stop at this point. We've, we've given you a basic philosophy and abstract mathematics. I, I'm tempted to say any questions, but I think that would be ill-advised. Is the rest of that available somewhere? These are tapes that I just got literally two days ago. Uh, uh, Gerald Stanley heard that I was going to be doing this presentation and he called me up and said, I got some stuff if you'd like to drive down to Elkhart, I'd be happy to give it to you. And part of that was a collection of videotapes. I spent most of today looking for a functional VHS player. <laughs> I now have four in my living room that don't work. Uh, the good people here at Shure called me literally minutes before I left the house saying, we think we found one that works, bring some tapes. So I grabbed the first tapes I could find, and you're seeing them along with me for the first time. Uh, in later years, Dick kind of lightened up a little bit um, in his presentation. This was one of the early ones, I think, that he did when he hadn't figured out who his audience was and what he could say to who. But man, I'm really, really, really excited to see this. And um, I'm hoping that we can find some functioning VHS players and digitize this stuff uh, before the tape turns to uh, the original compounds that it was formed out of. <laughs> So um, I, I'm, I'm happy to, to try to answer anything I can about, certainly about the archives, <laughs> uh, probably less so about what he was trying to say. But this, see, this is, this is what's fascinating about Heiser is that, you know, I was part of that early generation who had nothing to lose. I was in my early 20s when I first sat down behind a TEF-10. It's like, wow, this is really cool. Look at this. And it, it, I didn't realize that I was among the first people to ever see this stuff. Uh, and, and, you know, the people of the generation before me, they had stuff to lose. They had to unlearn stuff they had. They had to, they were much more critical of Heiser. It's like, hey, this guy seems smart. Let's push this button and see what happens. Whoop, oh, that's cool. But then what happened is a lot of us sort of stopped there. And, you know, like the slide that I had up earlier, we thought time delay spectrometry simply meant a sweeping oscillator and a tracking filter yielding cool results. But in his mind, this was just the beginning. He wanted to take this so much further. As he said in that, in that handwritten thing I showed you a little bit earlier, he kind of discovered this by accident. When he first built the first machine, he realized, he said in his words, yeah, I had a tiger by the tail. He realized that there was potential far beyond simply making anechoic measurements in real space. Yeah? So my, my experience was fairly limited. We would uh, sweep a room and, and look at where the different arrivals were, look at the, the plan drawings and figure out where were those echoes probably coming from. Can you talk about some of the other ways that people commonly used TEF-12? Sure. There were, by the time the TEF-12 was, was phased out, there, was a number of, there were a number of programs uh, available for it. And, and one of the things that, that um, if you were sort of in the club in those days, um, right up until his death, Heiser kept writing these sort of underground, we call them Heiser disks, you know, and, and uh, there was a community of people who would copy these and sort of send them around. And, and it was never clear that Crown whether Crown really supported the dissemination of the Heiser disk or not. They were terribly buggy. They would cause your machine to crash, but man, could they do cool things. So he came up with some very ingenious differencing schemes um, 
with that gave a level of precision that was unbelievable. But but you know most of us simply made measurements of transducers in real spaces. Um, a little bit later on, Farrell Becker came up with a polar ETC, which allowed you to sort of see where something was coming from in space, so that it took it to another level. Um, but yeah, it was it was pretty much confined to making measurements either in time or in frequency. But the big difference, you see, was that with timeless spectrometry, noise wasn't an issue. One of my early experiences with, with TEF was at a very early workshop I attended. Walked into a room and there were 10 TEF 10s sitting on tables. And they were all connected to one loudspeaker and all being fed from one microphone. And there were 10 people happily teffing away. And the cacophony was, was unreal. There's all these sweeps and chirps and different length sweeps and so forth. And no one was getting stepped on. Try that with your FFT. So it was that that noise immunity, I think, that was the big thing. The other thing for me um, is I, I saw pretty early on its, its value as a teaching tool. One of the things to use a TEF, even the current ones, correctly, you have to grapple with the uncertainty principle. You have to decide what is your frame of reference, what is the resolution of your measurement, and what you are going to sacrifice in order to gain something. At the risk of going out on a limb, I have never spoken to a smart user who could tell me what the resolution of his measurement was. <coughs> and I submit that if you don't know the resolution of your measurement, what do you know? So time delay spectrometry for me was, was a tool that helped me bring students into that realization that you, you're always trading something to get something. And even though, you know, you could argue that the machines were clunky and the software was clunky and it was not intuitive and so on and so forth, I think that if you disciplined yourself to work through that, um, that the benefits were, were really quite remarkable. I don't know if that answered your question, but... <laughs> yes? Uh, you, you said that um, Crown produced these theft I forget all the numbers in the series 10, etc. machines. What eventually uh, replaced that? They don't make this stuff anymore. What technology or products have replaced these tools? Right. Well, Crown built the TEF 10, which was the original box that looked exactly like the one we have out in the hall, except for the TEF 10 actually had, if you can imagine, my son carried it in. If you can imagine, Nathaniel, the TEF 10 was even heavier. It had a, a lead acid battery in it. Um, oh yeah, sure. Yeah, it was. It had a lot of steel in it. It was. It was heavy. Um, they designed it, or Gerald Stanley designed it, because he could. And <laughs> uh, later they realized, you know what? We don't really need to put a lead acid battery in this thing. And they upgraded some of the memory, and it came out as a TEF 12. And then a 12 plus, which had a little bit extra memory and uh, double density floppy drives. Weeha! <laughs> um, then they came out. Crown came out with the TEF 20, which was a single rack space, and um, ran on the first Windows software. I think it was Windows, whatever it was. I forget what was the first Windows. Um, three, yeah. <laughs> and. Uh, it, um, it was while they were producing the TEF-20 that a accountant type noticed that uh, TEF was losing money for, for Tecron, and they sold it off to Goldline, and Goldline then produced the uh, TEF-25, which is still in production, which is a small thing that looks like a USB pre, um, and it runs on uh, Windows software. And that's still available. Although, 
well, <laughs> this is being videotaped. Um, yeah, so to date, now the, the patents have all expired um, on time delay spectrometry. Um, Caltech no, no longer owns the rights to it, so anybody who wants to build one is free to do so. Um, there have been a few people who've toyed around with the idea, but so far uh, it really doesn't have a champion. I think there's some reasons for that. I think it's because, again, it's, it's, a, it's a technique that you have to think uh, if you're going to use it. Um, Doesn't Studio 6 Digital have a TDS module? Uh, I've been talking to Andrew about that, and we were talking pretty hard and heavy there for a while, and then all of a sudden, I'm not sure what happened, but he stopped returning my emails when I asked about TDS, so I'm not sure where he's, where he's at with that, but it's something he did talk about, yeah. But it never was, it never was complete. That would be pretty cool to be able to do TDS in your iPad. But. Yeah, the 2012 was, was um, also a commercially available TDS unit, although I, I, I'm not sure if many people bought that or how practical that is. We bought more than 20. <laughs> really? Yeah. Okay. You still use them? Uh, we've got three that still work. Okay. Yes? Uh, there is a team at uh, Starkey Healing Labs in uh, Minneapolis. Okay. That uh, led by uh, Professor Kelly Fitz, and uh, uh, who pioneered the mathematical met method that is analogous to time delay spectrometry, and it is called time and frequency reassignment. Okay. It uh, was presented at the Coastal Society of America about the, the six, seven years back. I need to get it. You and us together. Okay. Uh, in terms of question, of the question, can you let us know a little bit more about the archives, and where they can be found, and what is there? Right. Um, right now, um, the archives are part of Columbia College Chicago's library. Um, there's a professional archivist who's very good, who's overseeing the preservation and the cataloging of um, Heiser's papers. Um, and right now on the website, and I don't have any way to show you that right now, but um, I'll make sure through the AES that it's, it's disseminated. It was part of the program. The link was part of the program. Oh, that's right. Yes, OK. Yeah. Um, there are. There's a link to a number of his unpublished articles that have been put up on the website. So you can download, there's some, some great ones that are actually very easy to read. Um, 50 Years of Uncertainty, where he looks at the uh, history of the uncertainty principle 50 years after Heisenberg. Um, there's one where he kind of looks ahead called It's a Great Day Tomorrow. Um, there's another one that's really pretty controversial called The Great Pretender, where he really takes aim at the notion of um, group delay and um, blasts it pretty eloquently, I think. So if you're fond of doing group delay measurements, you might want to take a look at that paper. Um, and then, of course, um, Columbia College Chicago, the, the Department of Audio Arts and Acoustics, um, has down in the basement um, his original equipment, which you can go in and see. It's still in the display window down there. Um, so, you know, the, the idea is that people who want to do research, people who'd like to read more about Heiser, people want to dig in the archives, and um, it's, it's there for the, for the asking. You simply have to approach the archivist and make it happen. A lot of this is already available online. There's a finding aid, people right. can search and uh, comparative papers and so on. Uh, do you know of any timeline by which the entire physical collection will all be available <coughs> virtually? Because now about 40% is available. Yeah, I really don't know. I mean, it depends on, on the resources the college wants to put into it, yeah. Yeah. But I think that it's, you know, um, a good place to start without even accessing the archives is to avail yourself of this 
Um, you can see how loved my copy is. It's falling apart here. The, the anthology of his, of his work. Um, it's, it's remarkable. Um, well, it's, it's, it's not an easy read, but it's, uh, it's a way of getting a handle on what he was trying to say. And I think there was a lot, there's a lot that I found in the archives which are little scraps of things that, that are, are so tantalizing. And I hope that, um, I mean, my wish, as I said, is that some young researcher will take this up as, as a cause and see if he can figure out where Heiser was going with this and complete his work. Yeah. When uh, I first talked to you about <coughs> some, uh, I don't know, over, well over 10 years ago, you had recently obtained these materials. Mm -hmm. and could you tell us what uh, grading an archive needs? In other words, you, you get piles of papers and equipment, et cetera, and then that's sort of like uh, um, that is trying to create some kind of meaning out of all of it. What what are your plans, uh, or the school's plans for this archive? So we look through it in five or ten years. What might we see that we don't see now? Well, I, you know, the archive itself is is nothing more than a, than a collection, right? So so the notion of archiving is is probably twofold. One, it's to preserve the material in perpetuity. So here's we have some you know papers that that Dick actually wrote with his hand. These are are hopefully going to be preserved for a very, very long time. Secondly, it is a process of cataloging. So as we identify what these papers are, so for example, um, there are versions, handwritten versions of most, if not all, of the articles that are published in the anthology. One of the fascinating things to do is to go and find some of these handwritten versions of existing articles and compare them. What did he? What did, what wound up making it to press? What wound up not making it? What did he cross out? What did he say one way and decide to say another? I think certainly for historians that's a fascinating um, process. But I think it's up to scientists, it's up to researchers, it's up to people who are interested to look at the archive and make sense of it. The archivist won't be doing that. That's up to people who are interested to look at it and, and you know, uh, mine it for information and hopefully continue to publish papers about his work. All right. Well, thank you very much.